Welcome back to another episode of my podcast for the book, Hopeless Romantic, The Untold History of Ethiopia. I hope you guys are listening uh, to the podcast and enjoying it and learning something new. Um, Yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot to talk about. We're going to look at a new chapter today and uh, let's go right to it. You know what time it is. Uh, We always start off with a prayer. Today is no different. So let's gather our thoughts for prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean, holy, holy, holy is your name, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for bringing us together. We ask that you open up our hearts and teach us what you have prepared for us today. Lord, we ask that you are able to help us understand our history better. We ask this in your holy name, in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in the intercession of the Virgin Mary, and of that of the angels and the saints, we pray, amen. All right, guys, we have uh, a lot to discuss about. Like I said, um, these like starting from this point on, we are going to get into the like the real stuff. You know, Um, like I mentioned, I think on the the previous podcast, we're over with the introduction. We did the uh, general, you know, history. And these are kind of the more, I don't know, like interesting topics. I find them to be interesting topics that we're going to be talking about. Uh, and again, I just want to say, you know, if you haven't got my book yet, make sure to get my book. Um, there are a lot of things that I'm not going over in the book. Uh, but you know, just, um, the pod podcast is just supposed to be, uh, my, the author's thought on the book, right? So why not? Uh, so make sure to get the book, make sure to read it. There's some interesting things on there. If you're not already doing so, make sure to follow me on Instagram at D on Instagram and then on Twitter. As uh, Dawit Tamuluna six. Uh, I also want to take the the time to thank my patrons. Honestly, I couldn't be doing this without you. And once again, thank you for all the support you've seen, you've shown me. And if you want to become a supporter and become a patron, you may do so by going to patreon.podbean.com forward slash Dawit Tamuluna. Thank you again for all your support. So let's get to it. Uh, we are on chapter three of my book, Hopeless Romantic, The Untold History of Ethiopia, titled The Things I Do For You. Now, if you're just tuning in, uh, this book is written in a metaphor using the the uh, love that exists between a husband and a wife to say that I think that's how, uh, well, that's my love for Ethiopia. My true love is Ethiopia. And a lot of the things that we see in, in, in a marriage, I believe, uh, we see also in the nation's history. In this particular uh, chapter, I'm dealing with, you know, the need to be appreciated and the, and and the um, the importance of doing, you know, nice things for your significant other when you're in love. Uh, right now, if you guys don't know, I'm also um, involved with a Christian group uh, known as YOTC Young Orthodox Ohio Christians and. On that, I'm currently in the midst of, of teaching a course uh, titled God's Love Languages. Now, if you guys don't know what love languages are, it's based on a famous book. Um, and it's essentially saying that people understand and and experience love different ways. Some people understand love verbally. So you've got to tell the person that you love them. It doesn't matter what you do for them. They want to hear the words, I love you. Whereas some people understand love um, through quality time. And I was telling this to my students, you know, this is why, like, usually in a relationship, you could see uh, it's it's usually the girl who wants the quality time. So, you know, the guy is like telling her day and night, I love you. I love you. I love you. And the girl's like, I feel like you don't love me anymore. And he's like, I don't I don't know what you want me to do. And she's like, spend time with me because quality time is one of the ways that people understand love. Uh, physical um, touch is another one. And believe it or not, acts of service is one of the love languages that we have, the way, one way of expressing love to another. Uh, acts of service is basically when you do nice things for other people. And in the book, I kind of open up talking about not the love languages in particular, but how, you know, in a marriage, it's important to be seen when you do something nice to the other person. 
And more importantly, it's important to be appreciated. Well, when it comes to Ethiopia, I can make the case that uh, Ethiopia was very generous to other nations, other foreigners, other people throughout history, even though uh, other nations and foreigners were not nice to Ethiopia or Ethiopians. Especially in the earlier part of the history, during the great empire of Aksum, uh, we see that it was a Christian nation and and because it was Ethiopia doing great things for other people, we can really say that the church or even the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahara church was doing great things for other nations and for other foreigners. Now, I'm bringing this up in this chapter because I'm trying to tackle one of the biggest misconceptions about the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahara church, which is this. People assume that the Ethiopian church is somehow linked to a particular tribe or maybe that it favors one tribe over the other. Now, if you don't know, uh, many politicians tried to link the Ethiopian Orthodox Sahara Church specifically with the Amhara tribe. So when um, they're thinking about, uh, you'll hear like uh, statements being said like, oh, look at these elites. I don't know what that means, but they say that. And it's like code for saying, you know, the Ethiopian Orthodox Sahara Church was really linked with Amhara and the Amharas did a lot of these things and history. And and that's why the church is really favoring uh, one tribe over the other. It's really an ugly way to talk about history. Not only is it ugly, but uh, it's dangerous. And I'll talk about this in future uh, podcast, but this link between a church and a tribe was actually proposed by fascists in order to separate the people. They knew that, um, generally speaking, Ethiopians could unite under the umbrella of the church, not because of the tribe, but because of the church. And this was a dangerous thing. So what did they do? They linked it and they branded it as one tribe. And this is why we have certain tribes feeling that like the Orthodox church is not for them. Um, but again, it's just not true. And more importantly, it is dangerous. So, um, by the way, do you know, like the best way to start a war, you know, you know, the best way it has been done throughout the history. The best way to start a war is make people think they're fighting in the name of God. And you could get thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to sign up to die for a just cause or what they think is a just cause. And this is really, really sad. And, and what um, I can say about this is once you get people to believe that what they're fighting is religious or there's something holy or just about it, they're willing to die and they will go to extreme length to make it happen. And I believe that's what's happening in our country today. People are convinced that their religion, not their tribe, but their religion is in danger. And this is why people need to, uh, and there, I'm not saying there's no truth into that, but um, the genesis, the original mindset of, of connecting a tribe to a church or a tribe to a religion, whether that's Christianity or Islam or Judaism, was not something Ethiopians did on their own, but it was something that the fascists proposed in order to fracture the country. And sadly, they were successful. But in this podcast, starting with this podcast, I think we might have to do several sessions. We'll see how Ethiopia, far from favoring a particular race, was actually friendly to other societies and nations with different backgrounds. And, um, and hopefully you'll be convinced. So let's look at it. Let's see. Well, to address the issue of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahro Church favoring or not favoring a particular race, we need to say a little bit about how Christianity came to Ethiopia to begin with. According to our tradition, the first Ethiopian Christian is believed to be Bacchus, as described in Acts chapter 8. Uh, a few things to point here. Uh, I'm describing the first Christian and not the first person to accept the God of the Israelites. And the reason why I say this is, of course... Uh, according to the Ethiopian tradition, um, we believe that our ancestors accepted uh, the the God of Abraham way back in, in the Old Testament 
uh, as recorded in the book of Kings, First Kings chapter 10, we have the, the queen going to King Solomon. Of course, this is a tradition that, that goes back to all that time. But here, I, I'm referring to Acts chapter 8 to refer to the first Ethiopian Christian that's recorded um, in the Bible according to our tradition. And if you hear me, I keep saying our tradition, our tradition, because uh, modern day scholars do not believe the character illustrated in Acts chapter 8 was actually of Ethiopian descent. And here's why. They reject this idea that the person described in the Bibles is Ethiopian descent because they believe the term used for this individual from the Bible is the Greek Ethiopis. Now, if you recall from last time, this word in Greek has a generic term meaning black. It's not technically referring to a nationality, but in, like just the, the race, right? So he's just a black person. So according to Western scholars, they believe that Bacchus was just a black man, but not necessarily Ethiopian. And I'll point this out because, you know, um, uh, there are different thoughts in this, and I want you guys to understand the different arguments that's there. I don't want to give you guys a biased view. But the point is, since the Western scholar rejects that account from the Bible, they turn to archaeological discoveries to determine the date of conversion into Christianity. So now that, you know, they, they don't really accept Acts chapter 8 to be a valid reason to say that this is when Ethiopians accepted Christianity, they they point to other um uh, means other uh, evidences to see when Ethiopia accepted Christianity. And the most, I would say, notable discovery that aids our conversation is the discovery of coins dated to the period of Azana, who's believed to have reigned between 330 and 365 AD. So these coins, like there are three type of coins associated with the king. The first are coins which are uh, coins with symbols of stars um, and other foreign objects. And these these symbols are identified as symbols with pagan worship. So um, because the coins associated with King Azana have pagan worship symbols, scholars can, with reasonable you know consensus, can conclude, that during the time of Azana, it, there there was some type of pagan worship happening. So these are the first coins going on at the time. The second type of coins were uh, without any symbols and and mentions of generic terminology like the Lord of Heaven or the Lord of Earth. So uh, the, the scholars, after reviewing these coins, they came to the conclusion that they were the Ethiopians might have been walking away from pagan worship, but not necessarily to Christianity. And again, these are coins associated with King Azana. Um, and the reason why they don't think this is exclusively Christian is because the Lord of Heaven could refer to anything. It could refer to anything. It's not exclusively Christian. But the third type of coins discovered include symbols of the cross, the indisputable marker for Christianity. And again, all these three coins, the ones with the pagan worship symbols, the one without the pagan worship symbols, just generic terms like Lord of Heaven, and the ones with the cross symbols are all associated with King Izana. So from all of these um, coins discovered, scholars assumed that Ethiopians likely converted to Christianity at the time of King Izana in the 4th century. Because there's this clear indication of a pagan worship and then a walk away from pagan worship and then a clear acceptance of Christianity. Now, if you Google when did Ethiopians accept Christianity you're going to get a result that says 4th century. And this is why. There's a discrepancy between the Ethiopian traditional teaching, which says, you know, Ethiopians accepted Christianity from Acts chapter 8, right after Christ ascended, and the Western scholars dating it when Ethiopians accepted Christianity. But apart from archaeological evidence, we also have some written documents that corroborates the story of Izana's conversion into Christianity. 
And that's found in the homily of a man named Fremnat, also from Mencius, as it's pronounced in the West, also known as Abba Salama Kasate Brahan in the Ethiopian tradition. The homily is given by a historian named Rufinus, who relates about three foreigners who came to the land of Bihera Agazi, or the land of the free. This was one of the names given to Ethiopia at the time. In the story, we're told that uh, Fremnatos was entrusted with caring for uh, a young prince uh, named Azana, of course, the king that we're talking about, after the sudden death of his father. Uh, some scholars believed, at least in the past, that it was when Fremnatos taught Azana that the teachings of Christianity, uh, uh, or, or when Fremnatos taught Azana the teachings of Christianity, the king likely converted into Christianity. So, they say this is the proof, right? Here's the, 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 the writing documents that say that Fremnatos was teaching Christianity to Izana. Hence, this is the time when Ethiopians accepted Christianity. Now, I want to point a few things out here. Um, uh, if you guys have ever talked to black people, you would see that there's kind of a general idea that Christianity is somehow a Western philosophy, a Western idea. And, you know, Arabs are taught to be Muslims and Africans as being pagans. That's just generally, I understand I'm generalizing. Now, if you're like Ethiopian or Eritrean, you don't really like talk with, you know, you don't have a lot of black friends or you're not in the African-American community. This might be a shocker to you, but that's the general consensus is, you know, Christianity is a white man's religion. Arabs are Muslims and generally Africans are pagans. That's kind of the idea behind it. So I, I, I say all this because you've got to understand when scholars who study these things, you know, some of them were fascist. So the idea of Ethiopians, Africans accepting Christianity, especially like an early time in history challenged the world view that they had right it was like an impossible idea how can an african accept christianity that early in period that is they likely were wondering how these africans accepted christianity before other parts of the world and more importantly they were just as likely to have resisted the idea of ethiopians accepting christianity on their own right um what this means is scholars we're convinced that if Ethiopians or Africans indeed accepted Christianity at er in an early period, it must have been because someone else taught them the true and good faith of Christianity. Do you see how that works? Because they don't think that Africans could have accepted Christianity on their own. All this to say there's this desire in scholarship, at least uh, s sometime back, if not still, to some degree still exists today, to accredit the introduction of Christianity into Ethiopia to foreigners. Now, there is an interesting thing um, we should point out here in the story of Fermentius. The Ethiopic states that, um, and I'm going to read the uh, quickly and then I'll, I'll, I'll read the translation. It says, <laughs> Translation. A little by little, they were teaching him, that is, Azana, the faith of Christ, blessing be to him. And they built a house of prayer for him and gathered students while they were teaching them psalters and canticles. And the key part that I want you guys to focus on here is on the part where it says they gathered students, plural. As I argue in my book, the question is, who are these people constructing a prayer house for? Right. And where did these students, plural, come from? If, like the Western scholars suggest, Christianity had not arrived in Ethiopia until the advent of foreigners, that would mean the only Christians would have been Azana and Fermentius. You don't create a prayer room for two people. And where are these students? But if you recall from the previous episodes, 
We said that in the city of Adulis, which served as the port of the kingdom of Aksum, uh, like there were many foreigners coming there or many merchants who happened to be foreigners coming there for trade. And these came from all over Ethiopia uh, and, 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 and with different cultures, different philosophy, including from, of course, Rome and, and Europe and, and, and Asia and India. We, we, like, we know this happened. Um, and, and from other places in history, we know that when merchants come to, to trade, they don't, only, they don't only exchange goods, but also ideas, culture, and religion. So I don't see why anything would have been different here. Uh, starting from the first century, I believe that merchants were coming to Ethiopia and they likely talked to the Ethiopians about Christianity because that was the hot topic at the time. Everybody was talking about it. And Ethiopians could have as easily accepted it. So... By the time of Izana, Fremencius, Fremnatos, the foreigner that came in, likely gathered the other Christians who were already present and conducted Bible study with the young prince. So the person who converted is Izana and not the people. The people could have just as easily have accepted Christianity uh, to that point. That is to say, we can surmise Ethiopia's official state religion became Christian in the 4th century when Izana converted. But Ethiopians likely accepted Christianity much earlier than that, and I don't see a reason to reject this idea. Now, if we said this much about the date of conversion, let us return to the homily of Fermentius, because I promise there's a point I'm trying to make here. I'm not just talking about this for no reason. In this story, the historian Raphinos tells us that soon after Izana reached the age of adulthood, Fermentius journeyed to Egypt to ask the church to send a bishop to Ethiopia so that people in Ethiopia could practice their faith. And now, if you don't know uh, uh, anything about the Christian church, you can't really perform a lot of the services unless there's a bishop. You need a bishop to, do, to get a lot of stuff done. And the issue in Ethiopia is they didn't have a bishop. So Fermentius went to Egypt to ask them. This is in the story written. Now, the church ended up consecrating Fermentius himself as a bishop and sent him to Ethiopia to expand Christianity. So instead of sending a different bishop, it was St. Athanasius who appointed this foreigner, Fermentius, to go back to Ethiopia to become a bishop. Now, because of this, Fermentius, or Abba Salama Kasate Brahan, uh, came back to Ethiopia and, and expanded Christianity, he is accepted in the Ethiopian tradition as a saint and the first bishop of Ethiopia. So what does this all mean? Well, first, Christianity started outside of Ethiopia. This is a very important point, right? Regardless of when Ethiopians accepted Christianity, the reality is Christianity is not something that is exclusive to Ethiopians. Why am I saying all this? Well, going back to our original question, the very idea of grouping the Ethiopian church with a particular tribe or race is simply neglecting the reality that Christianity is not Ethiopian to begin with. Second, the first bishop from Mencius is believed to be a foreigner by the name of Abba Salama or Kasate Ibrahim. As I just mentioned, he is accepted in the Ethiopian tradition as a saint. And his life story can be found in the Synaxarian. This shows that the church does not see itself being limited to a particular country or tribe. It had no problem with affiliating with other nationalities. Truthfully, these relationships that Ethiopians established were connected with Christianity and had little to do to do with a particular tribe. Of course, it was a Christian nation, so a lot of the relationships they built were, were with other Christian nations. But that's not, that has nothing to do with the tribe, but just the national interest, because at the time, of course, things are different now, but at the time, the nation was a Christian nation. 
Um, granted, Ethiopia today looks a lot different than it did 2,000 years ago. And the same way of governing the nation is impossible. So I'm not at all suggesting because 2,000 years ago was a Christian nation, today we have to act the same way. No, they're, you know, the fact remains that Ethiopians, uh, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, accepted other religions as well. And Ethiopia looks a lot different than it did 2,000 years ago. But the fact remains that Ethiopians did favor Christian relations and especially during this period, there is no indication to show how the church or state somehow was aligning the church with a particular tribe, which is the question that we are answering. In fact, as we will see, early Christian Ethiopians were not simply looking to establish relationship with people from varying nationalities, but more than willing to host foreign figures in the land as well. Now, but this is not the only example how the Ethiopian Orthodox Soto Church was accepting of others. We'll see how they accepted uh, the very famous nine saints. Now, throughout history, the Christian kingdom of Aksum opened the doors to foreigners. And one example of this occurrence can be found in the hagiographies of the nine saints. Uh, according to the tradition of the Ethiopian Orthodox Auto Church, the nine saints are essentially a group of foreign refugees who went to Ethiopia to escape persecution for rejecting the decision of a very famous council of um, Chalcedon in the 5th century. Some of their names are Abagarima, Abaragawi, Ababentelion, or some of the, uh, these are the kind of the more common names. But before we get into that, let's just say some introductory material about the Nine Saints to give you a short background of the period of their migration. So around the 4th or 5th century, the Christian world was experiencing internal conflict. One of the major conflicts they faced was on theology, and specifically the theology regarding Christ. You've got to understand, right after Christ's ascension, there was this question about who is Christ, right? Uh, some people thought that he was an ordinary man. He was just a regular man. What, whereas uh, some people said he was a summit god, or others said he was God himself. He was just God. And others said he was fully man and fully God. And people debated about this for several uh, centuries. And the first official schism of the church occurred in the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. Um, uh, and part of it, they were trying to answer this very question, who is God? Now, the details of this council is too complex to su summarize here. But essentially, the formula proposed by the commissioners of the council regarding Christ Christology was rejected by a saint named Dioscoros and his followers. And the group that rejected this council of Chalcedon in 451 AD became known as the non-Chalcedonians. And the ones who accepted the council became known as Chalcedonians. Now, if you're wondering... The Ethiopian Orthodox Auto Church, along with the sisterly churches, have since uh, taken the side with St. Dioscoros and thus are known as the non-Chalcedonian church. Um, by the way, this is why when you hear Orthodox, not or all Orthodox is the same. Like the Russian Orthodox, they are part of the Chalcedonian church. So we are not in communion with the uh, Russian Orthodox. We're not Russian Orthodox. We're not Eastern Orthodox. We are the non-Chalcedonian church or the Oriental Orthodox group. Of course, Oriental means East, but that's a different story for a different day. Now, all this to say the nine saints were a group of Christians who were being persecuted for not accepting the ruling of the council of Chalcedon. Thus, it's believed they migrated to Ethiopia, who also, like them, rejected the council since they knew they would be received well by the Ethiopians. The reason why I'm bringing up the story of the Nine Saints is because it clearly shows how Aksumites were willing to accept foreigners. If the Ethiopian church was truly favoring a particular race, as some have suggested, then we would have accept, expected the Ethiopians to have rejected the Nine Saints when they came to Ethiopia, simply because they were foreigners, right? If, they're, if the Ethiopian church is for only a particular tribe, when they see some other foreigner, they would have rejected them uh, right away. But what we find is not only did they accept the nine saints into Ethiopia, but others have since gone to consecrate them as saints, hence why they're called the nine 
saints. It's important to mention that modern-day Western scholars like Stuart Monroe Hay doubts the very existence of the nine saints, and some have wondered uh, if they are fic uh, fictional characters. But these comments made by scholars is relevant for our discussion. And after all, the acceptance of saints is a matter of faith. And spending too much time on this idea would not benefit us. However, what, what's worth mentioning is that the life of foreign saints, known collectively as the nine saints entering into Ethiopia, was written by Ethiopians. This is a reality that even the most skeptic about the life of the saints can simply not deny. Hence, because the Ethiopians, in fact, did write about the life of the nine saints, who would later be consecrated as saints within the Ethiopian Orthodox Order Church, we could conclude that Ethiopians had a positive view of accepting alien nationals into their land. Once again, we see how loving and accepting Ethiopia was was of other communities but perhaps what is even more praiseworthy is that the people of ethiopia were able to embrace others who are of a different faith and we'll pick up here on the next episode i hope you guys are uh, learning a lot and enjoying the episode and the podcast let me know what you guys think in the comment section once again i want to encourage you guys to buy the book buy the book buy the book and uh, follow me on Instagram to, to see other contexts that I post. If you want to support, make sure to be a patron by going to patreon.podbean.com forward slash Dawit And hopefully I'll see you guys next time. Have a